Hi everyone, it's Beth from the West Dallas Public Library and welcome to episode two of the Let's Go on Vacation season, The Great Wall of China. Today, we are picking up on chapter two, Walls Grow Bigger. And it must because if you remember yesterday, the Great Wall is huge. The first ancient walls in China were built around 4,000 BC. Families built them around their houses and barns. Walls also protected their temples. In time, Chinese cities grew large and put up walls too. In fact, the Chinese word for city means wall. City walls enclosed an entire village in a huge square. The tops were wide enough for soldiers to stand guard. Heavy wooden gates were built into opposite sides of a wall. Soldiers guarded them during the day, letting townspeople pass in and out. At night, the gates were closed and locked. <clears throat> the Chinese made their walls out of dirt, huge piles of dirt. How could earthen walls stand strong against rain and wind? The secret lay in packing the dirt in thin layers. Each layer was pounded hard, rock hard, before the next layer was added. The Chinese pounded with their feet or simple stone tools. If you remember from yesterday, they didn't use any machinery when building the Great Wall. Ramming the earth this way removed all air pockets and kept the wall from sinking later. This method worked so well that the Chinese used it for the next 6,000 years. During the 400s BC, Chinese cities began joining together to form states. Each state was like a small kingdom covering hundreds of square miles. Ruling over each one was a warlord or king. Every state had a different resource. One controlled rich iron mines, another jade. Still, other states had forests of bamboo, fertile farmland, or miles of rice paddies. In time, states began fighting each other for control. Every king wanted to grab others' resources for himself. To protect their borders, kings started to build longer walls than ever. The biggest city walls had, had reached 20 miles in length, but state walls stretched up to 800 miles long. The Iron Age had arrived in China, so building walls was a bit easier. Iron shovels and sharp axes replaced tools made of wood and stone. However, there was nothing new about what went inside the walls. They were still filled with rammed earth. Fighting peaked between 475 BC and 2021 BC. These years became so violent that they are now known as the Warring States period. Armies with tens of thousands of soldiers clashed on battlefields across the land. No longer were bar barbarians the chief enemy. Now, China fought against itself. Early state battles lasted only a few days, but later on, armies raged against each other for weeks or months at a time. It was all out war. Huge armies numbering hundreds of thousands clashed on battlefields across the land. Battle plans called for attacks on all fronts. Foot soldiers thrust 18-foot pikes and slashed with dagger axes. Warriors on horseback hurled swords and spears. Archers shot from the platforms of charging chariots. Men at mounted crossbows fired arrow after arrow. In 246 BC, a teenage boy named Zheng took the throne of a state called Qin. By that time, seven states were still standing. Zheng set out to conquer the other six. For the next 25 years, he waged war. 
His forces captured 10,000 prisoners in one state and then killed them all. One by one, states fell to Zhang's military might. Finally, in 221 BC, Zhang crushed the last one. This ruthless man was no longer just king of Qin. He was supreme ruler of all China. Immediately, he renamed himself Qin Shi Huangdi. It means first emperor of China. So Qin lives on today in the name of the nation he, he unified, China. Hmm, I didn't know that. Chapter three, a ruthless ruler. China's first emperor was a man of two extremes. As a leader, he was a genius. Many of his reforms last to this day. As a ruler, he was a tyrant, cruel and unforgiving. Qin wanted to sweep away China's past. He ordered state walls to be torn down. Kings and warlords were stripped of their lands and weapons. New roads and canals were built to link distant parts of his empire. For centuries, states had passed different laws, spoken different languages, and paid for goods with different coins. Now, the first emperor command, commanded that all his subjects do things one way, his way. From then on, there would be just one written language in the land. New coins replaced the old. Traders had to use a single set of weights and measures. The emperor even demanded that carts be made with the same width in order to ease road travel. Most important, he set up a new way to govern the vast empire. Spreading over nearly 2 million square miles, it was the largest empire in the world by far. How could the first emperor organize all the millions of people living in this land? In a brilliant plan, he created the world's first central government. At the bottom were leaders of the villages, then leaders of townships, then counties, and so on. Each rank reported to the one above it. At the very top was the emperor. The emperor's far-reaching government turned a group of warring states into one smoothly running empire. To stay in control, Emperor Qin cut off all free thought. Scholars, the educated class had always held high places in honor, high places of honor in China. Kings had often sought their advice, not the first emperor. Scholars posed a threat to his power. Qin rounded up 460 leading intellectuals and buried them alive. Next, he ordered soldiers to search out all books in the empire and burn them in public bonfires. Only books on medicine and farming were spared. Oh, as a librarian, this hurts my heart. Scholars tried to save their books by burying them or learning them by heart. If caught, they were killed on the spot. The emperor's iron fist controlled daily life too. Citizens needed passes to go anywhere. No one dared to disobey royal orders. They ran the risk of losing a limb, being branded, or worst, beheaded. Fear of the emperor spread like a disease through China. He has all seen eyes, the nose of a hornet, the voice of a jackal, and the heart of a wolf, it was reported. Only one thing lay beyond the emperor's control barbarian attacks. Regularly, armed nomads still swept down from the north. They had to be stopped, but how? Emperor Qin settled on an age-old solution. He would put up a wall, a wall like none other before. This one would stretch 3,000 miles across the northern border. 
The first emperor was about to build the first Great Wall of China. Okay, I'm going to stop and do one of the little blurbs they have. This one is about Confucius. Confucius was a Chinese teacher who had enormous influence on his people. For centuries, men seeking government posts were required to pass a test on his teachings. Confucius taught that people were basically good and that leaders should be kind and just. One of his teachings was the first version of the Golden Rule. Do not do to others what you, what you do not wish for yourself. Confucius stressed good behavior on both the personal and governmental levels. Family loyalty was highly valued as well. Because of Confucius, every Chinese home kept a shrine to their ancestors. So do you think the emperor liked his teachings? I doubt it. Okay, that is where we will stop. Tomorrow we pick up with the first great wall goes up. So we'll get into business then. All right, thank you for watching the Let's Go on Vacation book club. And I will see you tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Bye.